The Grand Canyon, Northern Arizona, USA. One of the great natural wonders of the world. A place full of magic and mystery. There are about 20 layers of rock creating a kaleidoscope of color. Each layer holds its own secrets to the Earth's past. The white band of rocks at the top are about 250 million years old. As we go down, the rocks get progressively older. The band at the bottom, by the Colorado River, is over 2,000 million years old. In the great layers of rock, there is evidence of ancient volcanoes, deserts, and seas that once ebbed and flowed over the Grand Canyon Plain. Fossils of prehistoric creatures and plants reveal worlds very different from today's. For hundreds of years, the Native Americans have made the Grand Canyon their home. They have a creation story that goes hand in hand with the geologist's theory. Their traditional story tells how different worlds were stacked on top of each other, like layers of rock. We believe that uh, first man, first woman was created in the first world. The first world is the black world, the bottom layer. The earth was covered with water. It was all covered with sea. And then in the second world is when the land came about, the mountains came about, and the water receded. And then in the third world is when we had fire on our earth in our world when things were burning like the mountains they exploded and then after that came the drought and from here we believe that we go to the fifth world that's what we believe in our tradition every step you take up the Grand Canyon is like a leap of tens of thousands of years in time where one band of color ends and another begins signifies a dramatic change in conditions on the earth Geologists have managed to read between the lines when it comes to rocks. They can select a rock and get to know it, discovering how old it is and how it was formed. I'm nearly a thousand meters down in the Grand Canyon and about 325 million years back in time. And as a geologist, we get to know the personality of the rocks just as we get to know the personalities of people and the features of these rocks that tell me about their personality are their red, red color, and the fact that this rock is made up of clay, and this rock is made up of sand. These features tell me that this rock was laid down by a river. Behind us here, there's a big red layer where these rocks came from. And above that red layer is a white layer with a completely different personality. And the features within that white layer tell us that it was laid down in a desert environment. Where the red rocks end and the white rocks begin signifies a change from swamps and river sediments to desert sands. This white rock is sand that's turned to stone. And the slanted lines that we see in this sandstone tell me that this sandstone was laid down in a desert environment. And if I were to take a shovel and dig into a modern sand dune in the Sahara Desert, I would see these same slanted lines, and they would be telling me that the wind was blowing in this direction. One of the best clues to learn about a rock's past are fossils. And in this petrified sand dune, I've found reptile tracks. These are all individual footprints of probably the same lizard or early reptile that walked up the face of the sand dune. And this particular footprint here nicely shows the individual toes of the animal. 
Geologists have studied these rocks and discovered that about 260 million years ago, this layer was desert. But as we reach the top layer, which is about 250 million years old, we discover fossils which belong to a completely different environment. What we see here once used to be a broad, warm, shallow sea. And the reason that we know that is we've come across the rock type called limestone. And limestone is made up of a bunch of little bits and larger bits of shells. And I'll just wet this shell right here to make it stand out a little bit better. It's called a brachiopod, and it's much like the shells that we find on the beach today. You can see the outline of the shell here, just as the oyster has an outline to its shell. And the brachiopod has a hinge here where the two valves come together, just as an oyster has a hinge here. And this fossil shell here is from a creature that lived in a warm, shallow sea 275 million years ago. And here's another one down here. These fossil shells are part of this limestone rock layer that makes up the final layer at the top of the Grand Canyon. All these brown knobs sticking out of the limestone are individual fossil sponges. And we have a better example over here. What we're looking at here is a fossil sponge. And we know that because we can see these nicely preserved pore spaces, just like modern sponges have. And we know that modern sponges live in warm, shallow seas. Therefore, this sponge probably lived in a warm, shallow sea also. Well, we made it. You know, making my sandwich is very much like how the Grand Canyon was made. If you think about this white piece of bread and the mustard on top of it as one of the sedimentary layers, and then this piece of cheese could represent the next layer that was deposited on top of that. These pieces of salami would then represent the next youngest sedimentary layer. So the white bread would be the oldest layer, and the salami would be the youngest layer. And then sometimes, after layers are deposited, they're then removed again. And then, later in time, more layers are deposited on top of those. The Grand Canyon is not a complete record of time. Some layers are missing. The top layer was laid down about 250 million years ago. The layers which tell us about the age of dinosaurs and our own human history should be on top of the plateau. These layers have been eroded, washed away by wind and rain over a very long period of time. The layers may be missing at the Grand Canyon, but they still exist nearby at a place called Echo Cliffs. The rocks in these cliffs were once present above the Grand Canyon, but have been eroded. They are millions of years younger than the top layer of the Grand Canyon. We know this from the fossilized dinosaur tracks that have been found in these rocks. Recorded in the rocks of the Grand Canyon are about 2,000 million years of the Earth's history. It has helped to write an important chapter of the Earth's past. The universe was born about 4,500 million years ago. If we squash those four and a half billion years into 24 hours, then each hour represents nearly 200 million years. Thirteen hours, or 2,500 million years after the Big Bang, the oldest rocks in the Grand Canyon formed at the bottom of the sea. Clay and silt deposited on the ocean floor, and from time to time it was covered with lava from underwater volcanoes. 2,000 million years ago, the largest creatures alive were marine algae. Little is known about the Grand Canyon over the next 1,400 million years, because the rock record disappears. Layers of rock were added, and then eroded again. A 
At 8.58 p.m., 570 million years ago, the rock record begins again. Fossils found in these layers tell us that these rocks were formed in a tropical sea which came and went repeatedly over millions of years. Then, at about 10.37 p.m., 260 million years ago, the Coconino sandstone was deposited. The climate was very dry, much like today's Sahara Desert. We know this from the fossils of the animals alive at that time. At 10.40 p.m., three minutes later on our clock, the top layer formed, the Kaibab limestone. Fossils of many sea creatures exist in this layer. Some of these are still familiar to us today. The rock record of the Grand Canyon ends here some 250 million years ago. But other rocks nearby, which are about 200 million years old, carry evidence of dinosaurs. Then, around four seconds to midnight, between one and 200,000 years ago, modern humans appeared. Over four million tourists visit the Grand Canyon every year to enjoy and explore the geology of this wondrous place. Standing on the rim, visitors get to see nature at her best. It's like nothing else on Earth. Awesome. Fantastic. It's amazing. Beautiful. It's breathtaking. It's amazing. It's huge. At its highest point, the Grand Canyon is about 9,000 feet or 2,700 meters above sea level. It's so high up that some people suffer from altitude sickness because the air is so thin. A hike down to the bottom and back up can take several days. But if you don't fancy hiking, you can save your boot leather, get yourself a mule and pretend to be Clint Eastwood for the day. Yeehaw! Whether you're a tourist or a scientist, the burning question is, how did the Grand Canyon get to be like this? For a hundred years, scientists have braved the raging rapids and risked their lives to explore the Grand Canyon and discover how the Colorado River was crucial in the formation of the canyon. Today, many visitors are still asking the same question. How is it that some layers of the Grand Canyon were deserts, while the very top was once at the bottom of an ocean? What made the land rise up from the bottom of the seabed and thrust it more than 7,000 feet, or 2,100 meters, into the air? How do we take a shallow sea floor and lift it up so that it's 7,000 feet above sea level? Well, to answer that, we need to take a, a look at the Earth itself and how it works. Right now, we're standing on good, solid rock here. If we were to peel this rock back and see what was underneath us, about 100 miles down, we would find that the rock wasn't solid anymore. Instead, it would be this partially molten, slippery mass down there. And the crust of the Earth, the surface of the Earth, is broken up into huge plates that are sliding around on that slippery surface 100 miles down, and they're kind of like rafts bouncing around. This map shows where volcanoes and earthquake epicenters are found. They tend to be at the boundaries of the plates. Some of these boundaries are clearly visible. This is called the San Andreas Fault. It forms the boundary between the North American plate and the Pacific plate. It is estimated that the rafts or plates which the continents sit on move about one centimeter a year. For example, North America is still moving away from Europe. 
Over millions of years, the continents must have moved thousands of miles. So 200 million years ago, the world probably looked like this. Most of the Earth's landmass was connected like one big continent. The region we now call Arizona was then sitting on the equator next to Africa and South America. So it was in a much hotter climate. As North America moved northwards, the climate changed, and that's exactly what the rock record of the Grand Canyon tells us. Well, it's a very slow process, but over time, North America has traveled around quite a bit. And every now and then, our continental raft of North America has bumped into other rafts. And when they do, as they collide, the leading edges of those rafts start to fold and buckle and raise up. And that's exactly what happened here about the end of the age of the dinosaurs. Is that the theory? All mountains were created the same way of continents colliding? A couple of exceptions. Volcanoes, where you have just new material coming up. But this collision of continental rafts is, is usually the reason for a mountain range. Like the Rocky Mountains of today were lifted up the same way as this plateau was at the same time. Um, the biggest mountains on Earth, the Himalayas, were formed where we had a raft that was carrying Asia and a raft that was carrying India collided with each other and crumpled up to form the Himalaya. And it's amazing enough to find these seashells 7,000 feet above sea level. If you go to the top of Mount Everest and dig down through the snow, you'll find seashells up there. The land around the Grand Canyon was also lifted up by plates moving against each other. But what carved out the land? The Colorado River is an extraordinary excavator. It acts both as a knife and as a conveyor belt. At full flood, it carries 55 million tons a day. It would take about one and a half million trucks to shift all that material in 24 hours. So we have our layer cake of rocks that's been lifted hundreds and hundreds of feet above sea level, and we have our Colorado River, our knife, that is going to cut into that layer cake of rocks. Well now, as the Colorado River was doing the carving, our, layer, our rock layer cake wasn't sitting still. It was still rising up at the same time. So we had two processes working together here. The river cutting down and the Colorado River, or the Colorado Plateau, gradually rising up under the cake. If the Colorado River was the only thing working on the Grand Canyon, it would look just like this knife cut, a mile deep and 100 yards across. So obviously, something else has been going on as the river has been slicing down into the plateau here. Now, other forces of erosion have taken that little slice that the Colorado River has carved and gradually widened it out into the Grand Canyon that we see out there today. The other forces of erosion are rain, ice, and wind. Even the roots of trees can break rocks. In millions of years from now, rolling hills and gentle valleys will replace the jagged edges. Erosion created the Grand Canyon, and erosion will destroy it.